legislation this morning is rheumatoid wrist and hand, although I'll, probably, I'll take more of the principles of manage, uh, managing a rheumatoid wrist um, that you can take and apply to any part of the, the distal upper limb. Um, it's a big topic. I'll touch on the pathology, um, some of the management um, applications before we discuss specific uh, surgical options in detail. Um, so rheumatoid arthritis is an inflammatory arthropathy predominantly affecting the synovium. The prevalence in our community is approximately 3% and it's got a predilection for the female sex with women affected approximately four times more than men. Uh, causative agents is mostly immunological mediated arthritis. However, there is some suggestion that there's a genetic susceptibility. Um, certainly twin studies show a greater concordance between um, monozygotic twins and also um, uh, specific uh, genotypes, the HLA-D4 um, genotype has been shown to have an increased susceptibility to divorce, uh, developing rheumatoid arthritis. Um, the essential mediating factor is rheumatoid factor, which is the catch-all term which is used to describe the autoantibodies which are directed towards immunoglobulin in the patient's serum. Um, in particular, um, actually I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, when, um, when these autoantibodies start targeting uh, patients' own uh, cells, especially those of the synovium, there's an acute inflammatory reaction which is mediated by the usual culprits, TNF-alpha, interleukins 1 and 6, uh, which can then uh, descend into a chronic picture of inflammation with release of proteolytic um, enzymes uh, leading to a chronic synovitis and erosions of the periarticular joint surfaces and the cartilage surfaces, giving rise to that um, uh, classical appearance of <coughs> rheumatoid arthritis. Um, this then manifests uh, in our patients as joint instability and subluxation of those uh, joints. Uh, to make the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis, one has to have a good going clinical history, and that's at least six weeks of a symmetrical polyarthritis, um, uh, sorry, a polyarthritis associated with an elevation of uh, uh, the erythrocyte sedimentation ratio. Um, specific rheumatoid factors, um, ANA may be elevated, although an isolated elevation of ANA alone is not di diagnostic. Anti-cyclic uh, citronella citronellated peptide is much more specific for rheumatoid arthritis. Um, in fact, uh, uh, 70% of the patients who have elevated um, anti-CCP uh, do indeed have rheumatoid, however relatively insensitive. And so not all patients with rheumatoid arthritis will have an elevated anti-CCP. Um, biopsy has a limited role in the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis. Um, it, biopsy of the synovium only shows chronic inflammatory change, changes. And the characteristic um, uh, appearance on x-ray is that of periarticular erosions you can see here and here, uh, joint subluxation and arthritic changes, including uh, loss of joint space and subchondral sclerosis, which you can see in the carpal bones on this image. Uh, when taken in a surgical context, the management of patients with a, a rheumatoid disease really ought to be multimodal, um, in close association with a rheumatologist who can maximise the biological treatment of their rheumatoid arthritis and close, uh, uh, close communication with uh, an orthotist, a physiotherapist, and also a social worker, given that these patients have a tremendous burden of other disease and indeed um, have a shorter life expectancy second to their chronic inflammation, inflammatory state. Um, the initial s stages in managing rheumatoid arthritis, as we all know, are not surgical, and, but rather to modify disease activity, um, bringing inflammation under control as soon as possible using uh, quick-acting steroids such as methylprednisolone or um, oral prednisolone um, is the initial first step and then ongoing uh, disease modification uh, using drugs such as methotrexate or if methotrexate is not well tolerated, lefunamide, uh, with addition uh, of sulfasalazine or hydroxychloroquine. Uh, the older drugs such as penicillamine or gold are, are, less, are used less and less these days. Um, in addition to uh, bringing the initial inflammation under control and also attempting to modify the natural history of disease, uh, you can also have symptomatic relief directed towards the patient's pain 
um, and inflammatory symptoms using uh, usual non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, unless contraindicated. Coming more to our side of uh, the management, uh, when we see patients who have deforming disease of the wrist or the hand, we need to take into careful account who we're operating on and why we, we plan to stage our operations. And so for the, uh, the patients themselves, we need to take into account their factors, which would be their expectations from any operative intervention, including the long-term success, what their current level of function is and what they hope to preserve, um, how far their disease has progressed and whether there's any room for biological optimization before um, putting knife to skin. Uh, assessing their nutritional status, especially patients who have been on um, methotrexate long term. Uh, naturally, a careful examination um, is always important in orthopaedics, but uh, none more so in patients with rheumatoid disease, whose deformities present um, uh, difficult challenges for us to correct. And um, there's also uh, need to give consideration to the timing of your surgical intervention. Um, I'll come back to that last point shortly. We're all quite aware of the, the swan neck and the boutonniere deformity from our days as medical students, but in addition there's a, another a real uh, spectrum of rheumatoid changes that you see elsewhere. Again, we'll, we'll focus on changes we see at the wrist. So on the left here we have a, the hourglass appearance, um, which occurs in um, the early asymptomatic stages of wrist rheumatoid arthritis, where you get a, a synovitis surrounding the, the uh, synovial sheaths of the extensor tendons under the, the extensor retinaculum. Uh, the next image on the right here shows a kaput ulna, where you get um, subluxation posteriorly with distal radial ulna joint instability, leading to this bulging appearance here. Uh, the deleterious effect of kaput ulna is to put excess wear on the tendons, the extensor tendons that pass there over. Um, with chronic changes and disease progression, you get a palmar subluxation of the carpals and also an ulna drip. I was, uh, wasn't able to find a good image of an ulna drift. And here we've got uh, severe uh, wrist rheumatoid arthritis with uh, frank uh, radio ulna joint subluxation and dislocation which you can often elicit a piano key sign where the ulnar uh, silate is reduced and then as soon as you remove the weight of the finger it, it subluxes again. I mentioned a moment ago um, timing of our surgery for uh, patients with rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, any intervention that we would plan to do needs to have clear aims in these challenging patients and that would be to decrease decrease the pain that they feel, uh, improve the function that they can experience with their rheumatoid hand and wrist, and to try and limit disease progression. Uh, essentially, uh, you don't want to be planning for surgery until you're convinced that no further optimization could be gained from medical management. And the authors of a, a recent JOS article suggested after a period of three to six months of intensive um, uh, steroid initially and then methotrexate plus or minus um, uh, sulfazalin and hydroxychloroquine. They talk about uh, starting your surgeries on the, the lower limb prior to doing the upper limb because any uh, patient that has uh, need of a gait aid um, or uh, can, you know, assistance while ambulating will have limited benefit from a, a distal upper limb procedure uh, when they have a, an arthritic uh, arthritic knee or ankle and uh, continue to load that joint excessively. And when we do get to the upper limb considering surgical interventions, um, there's the way up between the, a severity of a distal um, uh, deformity versus correcting any shoulder or elbow deformity. Uh, again, the same point applies where there's little point in having a very functional wrist or a, a pain-free wrist when one has a severely painful elbow or shoulder which prohibits use of that upper limb. So very broadly, the procedures that one can do uh, can be broken down into, very, into these categories I've put up. Prophylactic surgery is that which is uh, considered early, and that essentially is um, excision of tendons, excision of synovium to try and halt disease progression and to limit uh, tendon rupture and also to control pain. Uh, once uh, tendon rupture has occurred, 
reconstructive procedures such as tendon transfers can be considered. In more advanced disease, um, analge uh, pain control and joint stability can be obtained from procedures involving excision of um, bony structures uh, with or without interposition of nearby soft tissue. Arthroplasty can also be considered in the upper limb, as can fusion. So to talk about um, some operations in particular, so considering a tenosynovectomy, really what we're trying to do here is offer the patient pain relief, um, and the indications for that would be for people who have active disease despite treatment. So that three to six month uh, window that I spoke about where biological treatment had um, failed to halt their disease progression. Uh, there is little point in performing this operation in the ankylose uh, joint of the, the wrist or the, or the carpal bones, uh, given that they'll have, uh, ben have little benefit of improved motion in, in a joint that's already stiff. And there is some evidence that tenosynovectomies can work. And so a retrospective review of 91 patients that had um, extensive tendon synovectomies of the extensive retinaculum showed that uh, a radiological study showed that the carpal height measurements that is preventing um, the palmar subluxation and ulnar drift can be prevented. And um, a lower level of evidence, expert opinion has been suggested that there's a lower level of tendon rupture in patients that do have tenosynovectomies. Uh, this is an example of a tenosynovectomy. This is an, uh, an extensive retinaculum tenosynovectomy. And so the, the authors of a recent JOS article advocate a, a midline dorsal approach to come back, come down onto the um, extent of retinaculum, uh, split it and to uh, raise a flap uh, to be used later. Um, a, uh, a neurolysis of a terminal branch of the posterior interosseous nerve uh, can be performed to decrease wrist um, innervation as a pain control procedure. Uh, whilst there, any bony prominences, uh, such as Lister's tubercle or the, any bony prominence of the ulnar head can be excised. And uh, using this approach, we can also use um, excisional methods, such as a Darich procedure or a suave capangi. I'll return to the Darich later. Um, and as I, I mentioned before, that can have good results. After prophylactic surgery, we have uh, reconstructive surgery with tendon transfers. And so those whose disease has progressed such that they lose their extensive tendons, um, you can perform a side-to-side -side repair. And this, is, uh, this picture here shows some examples of different ruptures. So here we've got rupture of extensive, extensive uh, digiti minimi, uh, which is being repaired with, a, with reflection of extensor indices and a side-to-side -side repair there. The, um, the, extent, the distal part of the extensor indices is preserved by, again, reflecting one of the extensor digitorum tendons across. Um, another procedure for tendon transfer that can be performed is to help prevent that palmar subluxation and ulnar drift that I talked about before. And extensor carpi radialis can be transferred across to, um, uh, to have a side-to-side -side um, tendon transfer to extensor carpi ulnaris. I don't have an image of that, I'm afraid. After the patient's um, disease is presented and after they, it's known that they've got um, ongoing disease where uh, reconstruction is not possible, uh, a pain relief procedure is excisional arthroplasty. And here's, a, for example, the, the Darich procedure whereby the ulnar head is excised um, uh, well short of the radiocarpal joint. Uh, and this is a management for uh, distal radial ulnar joint instability. Obviously this isn't the first line treatment and this would be selected for less active patients. Um, so usually extensive carpal analysis is preserved in this procedure, although for people who have ongoing pain or ulnar abutment despite having the Darich procedure performed, um, you can also perform a, a tenodesis of uh, extensive carpal ulnaris or flexor carpal ulnaris and have primary quadratus interposition between those two bones. Again, this operation can be done through that same um, midline uh, dorsal incision, which I showed you an image of uh, before. Um, fusion is another option for these, um, for patients who are experiencing um, pain and loss of function of the, of the small, uh, small joints of the hand. Uh, it can either be a, a limited or a total. 
Uh, this slide I'll consider limited fusion. And in this situation, you, one can perform uh, isolated fusions of the radio lunate joint or the radio scaphoid joint. And the indication for this is for patients who have only mild arthritic disease of the carpal bones and with sparing of the, the mid-carpal row. Um, it offers pain relief and stability uh, while still maintaining some movement of the wrist, uh, allowing for, for some function. So there's supination, opening a jar type um, uh, ranges and personal hygiene. Again, this is done through, can be done through a, a dorsal midline incision uh, with cyanovectomy around the cap, wrist capsule. Uh, cartilage between the two bones to be fused is, is denuded and then um, the, the orientation of the carpal bones is restored and any um, acute translation restored. In the setting of chronic translation, um, returning it to the, the anatomical position that, that that carpal bone should sit in is associated with more risk than benefit and more disability and pain for the patient. So in the steady of chronic um, subluxation, you would leave the carpal bone where it is. Bone graft can be used in fixation methods that we're all familiar with, such as K-wires, plates, or screws, can be used to um, hold the fusion together. And for this radio lunate uh, fusion, they haven't used any forms of fixation together, but have a good, uh, a good union there. Total fusion can be considered for patients with much more advanced disease. Um, where there's little hope, uh, little to be gained from soft tissue procedures or from a limited fusion. So these are those who have um, severe arthritis. The trade-off with fusing um, the pan joint fusion is decreased function, uh, especially those um, activities like opening a door, turning a screwdriver, or even um, activities such as personal hygiene or doing up a, uh, uh, getting dressed in the morning and doing up buttons. Fixation methods that we can use include an intramedullary nail. That image below shows a, a nail passing through the, the distal radius into the, the, the third metacarpal. Um, and that patient is there and has also had an, another fusion distally. Or we can use a uh, plate and screw method. And uh, this one is in approximately five degrees of extension, which is suggested allows for the patient to retain more function after their fusion has been performed. Um, arthroplasty of the, of the, of the wrist and, um, has been uh, flagged. It's much more popular with patients because it preserves function. However, there are much higher complication rates with having this procedure performed. Um, uh, the, although I couldn't chase down uh, figures um, offhand, the, the, the complication rate is still considered to be unreasonably high in patients with rheumatoid disease of the wrist. Uh, the complications really being loosening of the component tree, soft tissue ruptures over the, the arthro um, the prosthesis, although whether this represents the prosthesis itself or a um, progression of the disease activity, dislocation of the prosthesis and periprosthetic fractures. As I mentioned before, the Talking about soft tissue procedures for rheumatoid arthritis of the hand and wrist, there, there really is um, a whole spectrum of, of procedures that we could go through. Um, f obviously, flexor tendon repairs, carpal tunnel releases, and other procedures, um, excisional procedures such as the swath of Angie. However, the, the aim of the presentation today was to provide an overview of approaches to managing um, problems with patients with a rheumatoid hand and wrist. And that those approaches that I've described for the wrist can also be um, applied as principles for management of the, the metacarpals and phalanges. Um, so just to wrap up, um, the, the mainstay of management for rheumatoid wrist is really disease modification prior to surgery being needed. Um, having said that, there is a role for surgery and patients can have benefit for an operation if there is a willing surgeon. There's a variety of soft tissue and bony procedures that be, can, can be performed, um, but a, a appropriate pre-operative evaluation and selection of patients is important. Any questions?